welcome. Uh, this is the first uh, group uh, this side of the Atlantic. We had our first one a few months ago in San Francisco. So uh, you are trailblazing. Thank you for that way. Uh, my name is Stephen and I am the President and CEO of the Open Group and uh, uh, both of you all will welcome both personally and on behalf of the Open Group. Um, we're uh, trying, something to, trying something today with the Contoga Future Group where we think um, the timing is right for this. Um, those of you who are familiar with Toga, and I assume the reason you're here is either you're familiar with Toga or you'd like to be familiar with Toga. Um, it is really a very widely adopted standard around the world. We have more than 54,000 individuals who are certified for Toga 9 around the world. We have um, downloads and use in more than 80% of the world's top countries. So it really has become and continues to grow to be the de facto standard for doing it by architecture. Well, like anything, it's not perfect. Um, and one of the things that, from my point of view, and the people from the Open Group here uh, would like to get out of this session is um, experiences, your experiences, what it's like to actually use Toga, or what has what has been what has been good, what have you seen work, what have you seen not work. Those types of things would be great. What I hope you will get in, in return is the same kind of learning from other, other practitioners and other people who are using TOGO. Um, TOGO is involved here at the Open Group by the members of the Open Group Architecture Forum. Uh, that group has been going a long time now and um, there's a lot of, lot of organisations involved, more than 150 of them, and they work to evolve the standard um, and to try to take on board the feedback that they get. Whilst it's a big group, it's not anywhere close to the size of the community that is now using Toget. And that's one of the reasons that we're starting to do these user groups is to, to get that broader uh, set of perspectives and that broader, broader view of what it's actually like to use Toget um, in Hunger, um, in the Vegas. So um, this is this is not intended to be um, uh, too formal. Uh, we do have an agenda, and of course we have uh, on the agenda is a debate, which I'm very much looking forward to. Um, but uh, uh, this is really about you getting value from uh, turning up here today and meeting other people who are uh, using Toga uh, or considering using Toga. Um, the day will be hosted by uh, Terry Burbins to, to uh, two others, my right. Um, something you should know about Terry, he is, uh, has been involved with Toga for a very long time. So today we have um, our debaters. Uh, first, uh, we have Chris Armstrong, who's president of Armstrong Process Group, and uh, an internationally recognized thought leader and expert in iterative software development, enterprise architecture, uh, object-oriented analysis and design, UML, use case driven requirements, and process improvement. Chris, if you would. Oh, well, thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Chris Armstrong, and I've been arguing to change the Toga PDM specification to uh, make it annual. Uh, I think uh, uh, you've done a more than appropriate job introducing um, me, so is it uh, time to dive in? Or do we, I guess, what's not clear, do we then bring my honorable opponent up? Do you see me? Okay. Our next debater is Paul Bowen, Technology Strategy Consultant at IBM. is a certified distinguished IT architect specializing in enterprise architecture. Joining in IBM for the user environments, having worked as a chief architect in both the UK Post Office and Royal Mail, so he's not only uh, established enterprise architecture practices, but he's had to live with the consequences of that. It's very, very good. And uh, Paul, would you please introduce uh, good morning. Uh, yes, so thank 
thank you for the introduction. Um, the main thing I've played about that is the photo. So, you know, that is still me, uh, but I really wish I'd say that. But uh, I will be, thank you, arguing um, against the proposition that the OCAC ADM doesn't need to change. Uh, so, uh, that's my position. And Chris, you now have seven minutes. All right, well, uh, again, uh, I uh, certainly a privilege to uh, participate in this um, um, experience, which I am certainly recognized by the uh, open group staff and the uh, user group uh, uh, community, uh, that this is certainly a demonstration of what it means to be active, right? To do experimentation, fail fast, fail early. Um, but my, uh, the reason that I am for uh, changing uh, the TOGAF uh, uh, specification, in particular the architecture development method, uh, to your point, whether that is a uh, minute change of adding a period and you know, dotting an I and crossing a T, the extent of the changes, uh, we'll, I think we'll talk about uh, in our discussion uh, this morning. But let's just you know, start off with um, you know, what does agility mean? Uh, so if we take you know, from uh, Merriam-Webster, um, agile is marked by a ready ability to move with quick ease and grace, or having quick, resourceful, and adaptable character. Um, and, and, and I'll extrapolate how does that translate into uh, you know, what the current version of the specification, version 9.1, published in 2011, uh, how it uh, may or may not embrace that. Uh, but I'd also like to broaden this uh, to think about you know, what does it mean for an enterprise to be agile? And so we uh, often borrow on a definition uh, by Gardner back in uh, 2009, the ability to sense environmental change and respond effectively and efficiently uh, to that change. And I certainly would uh, suggest that any business leader, you know, uh, propose, uh, so that would be presented with that proposition, very few would say, no, I would just assume be ignorant about what's happening inside my organization and out in the marketplace. And, and when change happens, I would just assume haphazardly respond to that very sloppily and uh, without good uh, discipline and expected results. But let's look at, you know, what is the evidence uh, in TOGAF that it is or is not agile? Well, let's do a simple forensic investigation. Uh, the word agile appears two times in the entirety of the 692 pages of the TOGAF specification. Uh, and then one might claim it'd be interesting to, 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 to support the proposition that the ADM and TOGAF are agile when the body of knowledge that describes it is 692 pages. Then if we go a little bit deeper, uh, how often does the word agility appear in the standard? Uh, it appears six times, so that's an improvement. However, five of those are relegated to a specific chapter on service-oriented architecture, which might lead someone to concede that if TOGAF is indeed agile, one must use SOA as an architectural style to realize that agility. Uh, the word uh, lean, I mean, what, I'm sure people have heard about that being an important dimension of what uh, uh, doing agility means in the, in, in the real world, is not mentioned at all. So I think if we take a look at just some simple word counts, there doesn't seem to be a lot of recognition uh, within the standard uh, that an agile, that agility is something that we need to be uh, concerned about. I will, however, uh, concede that there are a number of white papers that have been published over the years, and at last count, I think there were about uh, five or six that had the word agile in them as it relates to the practice of enterprise architecture or lead. So to me, that's seems to be, again, supporting evidence that because of the absence of how TOGAF ADM addresses agility, it has had to be supplemented by additional uh, guidance. It is not normative, uh, but informative. So I think that uh, for, you know, supports some evidence that, that is, uh, uh, there is a want within the organization. Now, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to uh, uh, interact with the audience, but I presume that there are many people here that are familiar with the architecture development method. Um, if you are not, I would please ask you to refer to page 28, section 2.2 in the TOGAF 9.1 pocket guide uh, that you sat upon or sat next 
to. And so if you would uh, open that up, uh, you might be uh, get your exposure to what's uh, you know the Reverend would call in many cases, particularly here in the UK, the crop circle. Um, and so if we take a look at the crop circle, um, and I will acknowledge that there is uh, extensive urban legend that my formidable opponent uh, had a, uh, a significant hand in con conceptualization of that visualization of the life cycle. Uh, which I, you know, gratefully, gracefully acknowledge that uh, paramount contribution. Uh, however, if you take a look at it, well, what do you do? You start at the preliminary phase, there's an arrow pointing to phase A, architecture vision. And then there's an arrow pointing from phase A to phase B, business architecture. And then to information systems architecture, technology architecture, opportunities and solutions, migration planning, uh, implementation governance, and then architecture change management. And so if you take a look at those little arrows in between the circles, it certainly implies that this could be interpreted as a deterministic waterfall approach towards development. The thing that is ironic uh, in the standard is that there is actually statements that say, well, please do not misinterpret that diagram. It is not meant to imply that it is deterministic in waterfall. And as a, uh, a practitioner of enterprise architecture, as well as my organization uh, being uh, um, uh, very much a part of trying to uh, educate uh, end user organizations about uh, what it means to practice enterprise architecture in the context of the architecture development method, um, I often find myself explaining, don't pay attention to that picture. That's not really the way you do it. And the fact that, again, that is recognized in the standard itself, I think, is, again, substantial evidence that perhaps a you know, reworking of that might be uh, appropriate. Uh, if, we, you know, if we take a, a step back and think about it, uh, you know, there's a difference, again, between what the standard says and how people uh, practice it um, in, in the real world. And I think there is, you know, to acknowledge, there are likely very many people out there that have been able to figure out what does it mean to practice uh, enterprise architecture in the context of the ADM in an agile fashion. However, I suggest that that extrapolation has been solely dependent on those end users figuring out what that meant. And as presumably the world-class organization for the advancement of enterprise architecture here at the Open Group, I think we can do a lot more uh, service to the end user organizations by providing more uh, prescriptive guidance on what it actually means to do that. So, um, if we think about uh, extrapolating some of the best practices from agile solution delivery, uh, one thing that I'd like you to consider is, um, um, you know, a, a very important principle is the ability of testing early and testing often. You guys familiar with that? So one thing to throw out there that I do believe we can provide some guidance on is what does it mean to test an enterprise architecture? If we do a little bit of enterprise architecture, how do we provide that to the consumers to get rapid validation and feedback and then make those adjustments uh, to our delivery approach so that we end up actually delivering something uh, of value? And enterprise architecture in many circles has been observed to be a very monolithic process with long life cycle that is out of touch with the fast pace and delivery of a lot of teams. And I think there's fundamentally an impedance mismatch, which is another part of what I think we need to do to make TOGAF agile, is to really support what's called the agile enterprise, both upstream for doing agile decision making and planning, as well as downstream. Thank you very much. I have to say, well done. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Um, Paul. Yeah, thank, you. So, thank you very much, and, and thank you for my worthy opponent for setting me up so much. Um, so, I'd like to argue against the need for uh, the change to the TOGAP ADM. Um, and when I kind of looked at that, um, I looked at it all right. First of all, the TOGAP ADM. You know, being an architect, everything has to have some kind of reference definition. You've got to be clear, uh, and uh, the audience actually pointed out how clarity is useful when you're trying to understand something. So the take up ADM, you know, what is it? Well, is it the crop circle? Um, that's a, a visualization, of course. Um, but I, I, for me, it's a framework for developing architecture. 
that's an obvious statement, but that's kind of what it says in the title of the architecture development method. Um, and uh, it, it's actually available for any purpose, any organisation, any level, any scale. Um, it's not a style guide. Okay, so it doesn't tell you the style in which you should develop that architecture. Um, and um, the Tokyo gas specification, one of the things I think is relevant to sort of recognise, 692 pages, as my colleague has counted, um, has, uh, is actually part of a wider ecosystem of uh, material that includes translations, pocket guides, uh, training material, uh, exam uh, questions and qualifications. There's a lot of things that supplement the TOGAP ADM app, which is at the heart of all of that uh, environment. So, uh, I also talked about the word Agile and what that means. Now, for me, uh, actually, when I'm looking at Agile, I I'm really talking about Agile development. Um, I'm not talking about how easily I get to the bus stop in the morning or whatever else. I, I really do mean agile development of changes into an organisation. Uh, so, the project has changed stuff, basically. Um, and uh, I look at, I don't know if people have seen it, I think it's definitely worth viewing the Spotify videos that, that are available on the, on the internet. People have seen, they've been talking about squads and drives and chapters and guilds and this kind of stuff, how they do their agile development. It's very informative. Um, Decoupled releases, all that sort of stuff. And, and actually, it gets away from what I would call the project management bureaucracy, which I think is brilliant. Um, and you know why? Why do we have agile project development? Well, faster time to market, greater customer satisfaction. Um, these are sort of some of the claims around around. It. So the purpose behind agile. Don't just do agile because somebody said everything's going to be agile, right? Or well, hopefully not. Um, so in reality, though, um, is everything agile from day one? Can everything always be agile? Do you have certain parts of your enterprise that you don't want to be addressed in an agile manner? Do you have to deal with a large legacy? All these things actually make it much more complicated than a simple either or. Um, so, uh, this brings me to the point about agile uh, and the ADM, agile enterprise architecture. Now I think the key thing to understand is the difference between doing enterprise architecture in an agile way, and I'll call that agile enterprise architecture, and doing enterprise architecture for agile development. Two different things. The, the second one is if you're going to address agile and agile project development in your organisation, then your enterprise architecture needs to be relevant to those efforts. It needs to be consumable by the people doing the agile development. Uh, it needs to be accessible to them. And it can't overly constrain them and put them back in the world of waterfall and, and those kind of things. However, the question is, whilst it sounds like you're going to do agile EA, I would question whether you really need it or not. Um, doing enterprise architecture, developing architecture in an agile way, why? Why do you want to do that? Does it matter if it's taken you a very long time to develop the enterprise architecture, bear with me on this one, had a long approval and sign-off process, gone through a lot of pain to make sure it's well documented, well published, highly available? If at the point of consumption, the agile project is there when they need it. Yeah? It's there when they need it and it's there uh, and they can continue, but it doesn't happen and they can carry on. Now clearly, you know, I'm not advocating that things should take longer and be you know, uh, more difficult, but agility of their enterprise architecture efforts is not the goal that we're aiming for. What we're aiming for is agile changes to agile project developments. So, just for me, um, and I, I did work at Royal Mount Post Office as a, a, as a chief architect before I joined IBM. And for me, one of the key things about all of that was the word pragmatism. And 
enterprise architecture, um, there are frameworks and methods that, that you can look at and get guidance about what to do. Um, but it's all about pragmatism. And nowhere I don't think it sits on the nice pages does it say don't be pragmatic uh, in your application of this framework. Uh, so one of the key things for me is if you've got a vast number of projects to go on, if you've got lots of things going on, if there's lots of changes coming at you, how do you apply the right style to address that? Um, so for me, it's about doing things like having coping strategies. How do you work out what things you're working at, what do you have to do, what do you want to leave? Things like doing just enough architecture just in time. Because otherwise it's all going to be out of date by the time you start mapping at one end and you the other end. Now to me, these are, if you like, agile practices for enterprise architecture. So actually what I'm saying there is, it's not the spec that's important, but the behaviours. The softer skills of an enterprise architecture in interpreting the specification and how they use it in that environment. And just for that, I'll add in what I call the enterprise architecture democratic oath, which is I will apply for the benefit of the enterprise all architectural practices which are required, avoiding those twin traps of over governance and architectural nihilism. So, so what? So for me, Togac ADM is about enterprise architecture development. Agile is about project delivery. Um, you need pragmatism, you need engagement. So for me, to address agile project development, those white papers that Chris referred to are exactly the sort of the supplements that we need to be able to bring uh, and demonstrate how to use a core that doesn't need to change, but we just have to show how we interpret it with supplementary material. Yeah, it's a very, very nice question. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So uh, certainly, I, I think it'd be appropriate to say that you know the body of knowledge, is, you know, represents a set of uh, patterns, uh, although it perhaps doesn't explain it uh, in the typical way we might explain a lot of those patterns. Uh, uh, but it does not, in my opinion, have um, a lot of anti-patterns in it, uh, which I think is a you know, compensation for that. So it's, I think it's more, just because TOGAF uh, specification does not say that you cannot do Agile, I believe, based on my experience explaining this to end user organizations, does not mean it is evident that it can be Agile and how to make it Agile. Uh, I know the first uh, response that I get from a lot of people that are coming from the solution delivery community, particularly when they're faced with, well, the word architecture, oh my goodness, that's a horrible, awful thing for Agile. Enterprise architecture, well, that's even worse. It's big. There's 692 pages of content you're going to force me to get my brain around to understand this. These are all, in my belief, inhibitors to embracing Agile by the primary consumers, of it, which I believe, uh, apart from, again, upstream being uh, the planners that are trying to do, make uh, informed decisions. But again, the best laid plans that come out of phase F and E for a you know, roadmap and a migration plan, if the people that are asked to deliver upon it do not understand how they fit into it and see a cognitive dissonance between the, the concepts that are being described within the official specification, I think there's a huge risk that that translation from uh, going from the enterprise architecture to solution delivery and implementation um, is at risk. And uh, I don't have, uh, again, statistics in front of me, but I would guess that you know, many of your, the organizations of the participants here uh, are doing some kind of agile delivery. Is that likely true? Uh, so I think we do a great disservice, uh, you know, with a great uh, also a deference to the statement earlier, that TOGAF does not need to change. Well, isn't that the hand, in fact, the definition of what being agile means, responding to change? And I think we do, uh, again, a great disservice by not recognizing significant paradigm shifts in what delivery means from waterfall methods of many decades ago to what is now perceived to be the best practice for solution delivery. And basically to say, trust us, don't worry, it's in there somewhere, you'll figure it out yourself. Paul, would you like to respond? Um, well, I don't know how many times it's mentioned, but I can have a guess, um, likewise. But I think, uh, for me, um, it's a prioritization exercise in a lot of ways. In, in I think that I could find many values in, in making something appropriate uh, and up-to-date to, to address that kind of thinking. Uh, uh, but if I was to prioritize uh, those efforts and that, that energy, um, for me, uh, I think it's worrying about the behavior and the interaction of uh, enterprise architecture functions with the projects that they have to work with would be where the energy goes, and less so actually worrying about uh, the specification. Um, as for the points around um, access, I, I do think that's a key part. But again, for me, in some ways, uh, the fact that something's complex, um, how you position that and make it available uh, is a supplementary thing. So I, I, for me, I'd like to think we could help people access the body of knowledge without having to reconfigure the body of knowledge every time we come up with a new concept. Yeah. Uh, I think there is a need to make some clarifications here because my maybe I'm wrong degrees, but what I have taken here is agile for agile sake. So the very key question here is agile who want? Because who doesn't want to be agile? Agile is, is, is something that we all want. It's, it's a good per se. Right? But here, then if the general attitude is agile, yes, of course, we need to uh, the ADM to be agile. But if it means we need the ADM to transform or into what is the agile methodology for software development, we say no, they are very different. Agile is tactical, the ADM is a strategic. 
And if the queue were at the end, because we are not doing a job for a job sale, we are doing this for adaptation, for adoption. Because they are, that is what is going to give an enterprise the right to survive. Then we won't be looking how many times the agile word appears in those 600 pages because it's not relevant. I have seen a portal delivery in our organization and it was a portal because it said it was a portal. But it wasn't a portal and everybody accepted it. <laughs> so, it is really relevant in a sense. So I would say that the, the, uh, the ADN is, in, it, it's not waterfall. And obviously it's organized by stages. That's the, the human brain works that, that, that way. Multitasking is a myth. So we have to go down the route. But what I find is that the, the being iterative is much more. It's not waterfall. It's dialectical. You only understand the business architecture. Architecture, once you have gone down to the information systems architecture, and yes, you're absolutely right. But you are for some reason now. Right, okay. So, right. Did you make your statement? Question down with it, or is there a question? Uh, no, it's, 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 it's okay to make a statement. Well, it's a statement question. <laughs> Um, I would disagree that it is a tactical thing. Um, I would suggest that in order for organizations to survive in the incredibly fast, you know, changing reality in 2016 with you know, evolving business models, markets, and technology, uh, that you know, I don't think there'd be too many people would say, yeah, no, we don't need to get like I said earlier that we need to be ignorant of change and respond inappropriately and ineffectively uh, to that change. Of course, everybody wants to be agile, but I guess my my experience is, this, is a lot of people um, want to be agile, but they don't know how to deliver it. The, one of the anti-patterns I've seen in agile solution delivery is it's just an excuse not to follow a rigorous process, not to write things down, not to make informed decisions. And it's really, you know, coded language for you're not a boss of me. I'm going to do whatever the freak I want to do. Let's do it. So, you know, my experience, as perhaps many of yours, is that, you know, behaving in an agile fashion actually requires a significant amount of rigor. And what I think, you know, enterprise architecture brings to the table for those efforts is a, a, a data-driven scientific foundation for supporting the hypotheses and conclusions as opposed to the way most decisions are made, which are very uh, um, uh, superficial um, and uh, seat of the pants, very speculative. That is, there's not a lot of grounding on it. So I think that the, thing, I, the irony, I think, with this is that uh, enterprises need to be agile. Enterprise architecture is a way to support and, and they actually instrument an organization to deliver on agility. But the fact that the, the specification does not use that language to uh, to just describe that, I think, is a shortcoming. And I think it turns a lot of people off that this is not for me. I, I, I think it, you know, we kind of moving around a similar sort of point in, in a lot of ways. And, and for me, um, the analogy that I'll, I'll draw on, I'm kind of making this one up, so it's bound to the um, But it's a bit like um, you know, somebody who comes to uh, service the, the heating in, in a house. 
and you know, the, imagine that they are the architect, the, the consumer in that case is the person who works the house owner um, and, and they need their boiler servicing. Um, you know, there's a tool bag. For me, Togaf ADN is a tool bag. And the fact that that tool's got spanners, wrenches, screwdrivers, things in it, that's fine. I'm the qualified uh, uh, you know, engineer who can go out and service that boiler. The boilers will change. But actually, and, and, and maybe the tool bag needs some change to, to do that. Um, so, you know, I, I can see that. But actually, what's really changing, in, 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 for me, the kind of the agile approach, is the, the customer service expectation model is different. So, you know, you, you can't say, I will turn up sometime in the back end of the week. You have to arrange, it's going to be 12.30 on Thursday when the home is going to be in. You have to be well presented and clean and not leave a mess. You have to have a dialogue and, and be polite, um, not to use profane language uh, in front of the small children in the house, etc. etc. Those behaviours are more prevalent and demanding today, and that is a style. My tool bag could well remain exactly the same, uh, but my behaviours and how I apply it um, need to change. I don't think that behaviour set sits in my tool bag. Okay. This is the next question. Uh, there we go. Uh, here, in terms of the architecture work, I'm getting involved in, oh sorry, uh, here my, my screen. Um, often, well, pretty much all this time when I start a piece of architecture work, I actually need to start the sets and understand what's being asked to deliver. And part of that is time scales, you know. Is this something which could be done in a short time scale, or do I get the, the luxury of a long time scale and the complexity of the architecture as well? Very much informs how I approach it. Um, I think it's really a question for you, Chris, in terms of taking the, the, the question literally. Are you saying that we should be replacing the ADM with purely an agile approach and therefore waterfall is no longer an option for us as architects? Uh, very interesting question. Um, I, uh, I, I, I guess, you know, one of the proposals, because a part of this is, well, you know, if the ADM standards should change, exactly how should it change? And one thing could be, you know, is there a need to recognize uh, agile development? You know, is, as Mr. Lambert said, is, is agile development prohibited in TOGAF? No, absolutely not. But does that mean we have two guys? How to do TOGAF with agile? How to do TOGAF not with agile? How many people would read? But yeah, how many people have not with that? Yeah, that's the way we're going here. Uh, I do think, though, we need to acknowledge the complexity of a lot of enterprises. And to be, you know, certainly uh, uh, oversimplistic, uh, many enterprises are in a position right now that really compromises their ability to be agile because of the fact that they have not been agile for the past one, two, or three hundred years. So how do I compensate and recover from that fact? And so, you know, organizations like Amazon, Spotify are often held out as the golden standard, right, for agile. But I think, and I don't want to put words in people's mouths, but I think a lot of people overlook the fact that they have an incredibly convenient luxury, right? No legacy, although they are building their legacy now. So it might be interesting to, to go back and talk to Amazon and Spotify in a hundred years to see how easy it is uh, for them to do that. Um, I do think there is a there is a paradox, though. I mean, we do want to be able to do long-range planning. However, does long-range planning always mean taking a long time to do long-range planning? And I'll admit, you know, in TOGAP, when it talks about describing uh, future state architectures, there's a deference to describing those target architectures at a higher level of abstraction with less detail in order to give the organization an opportunity to respond to you know the changes that are happening on a, on a regular basis. Uh, but I do I do think though that we, we uh, and, and just to take a you know a, 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 a step to the left or the right. One of the places that enterprise architecture, and I'm you know, borrowing on my uh, colleagues, Hippocratic as aspect of enterprise architecture, which I think in the physician space is thou shalt do no harm, right? And how many software development teams would go, oh yeah, 
the enterprise architecture function is not doing me harm. I'm out there on the leading edge, embracing new technology that wasn't didn't even exist yesterday. I've got to submit a request to get this technology approved, and guess what? They're going to approve it by the time this project's done, or after it's been in operation. So I think we've got to find that balance, and by no means do I suggest that this is a simple uh, a problem. Uh, but there, um, um, but I do think that we ultimately do want to embrace an agile approach to the entirety of the enterprise. I call this, and many others, the impedance mismatch. How can solution delivery be speedy, really, really, really fast and tight, and, and all this when all that's happening in the enterprise? And enterprise architecture is going junk and junk and junk and junk and junk and junk, and then an annual, biannual, you know. Uh, 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 planning is going even slower. So in many ways, I think the agile solution delivery, um, in some ways, is compensating for the lack of agility everywhere else throughout the enterprise. And I think we need to think about normalizing that across all the different uh, parts uh, of it so that it doesn't solely rest upon uh, the solution delivery team. Point B, maybe they wouldn't have to be so agile if everybody else was maybe a little more agile. Change 
now a, a, a job. And the reason is, I worked for more than five years in the financial services space. And now I see some organizations trying to make the reality of, of, of the buzzword of the job, which is now nice to work with small teams. They're really good about delivery. But an enterprise architecture is part of the strategy to deliver. We have to reach both worlds. We have to address all organizations' needs. So what they find missing is not uh, adopting the, the framework in a manager way. We miss the way to help people formulate the strategy and convey it downwards. We miss uh, reference frameworks for other industries, like the idea for IT, which is very good effort. So I think that at the moment, Agile is still the largest in the buzzword, trying to find its way into uh, reality. And um, at the time, I think that we as members of the open group should focus on delivering more reference connections, helping people do more than reference understand that they put their business people or uh, CEOs understand what is the price protection, why it's valuable, and uh, make it more tangible way through the tools, you know, to deliver things, more hands-on things. So that's why I think that at the moment, uh, focusing on changing the standard, it's not so widespread, but the way it is, uh, what I would like to be here with you. Uh, well, I guess I, I would concur that we, you know there is a risk of again changing things for change sake, right? Be agile for agile sake. So we just don't want to, you know, throw the baby out uh, with the bad water. Uh, but I do think, uh, you know, first the, the, the first exposure to the method um, being the crop circle, it just sets the it just sets the tone. It's not in a very effective way. There's in many cases if you show. Um, uh, share with executive management, CIO, CTO, CEO, what TOGAF is all about. It's highly likely you're going to show them the crop circle, and they, but that may be the only image that is burning in their mind of what this enterprise architecture thing is. So, but, but, but I would agree that you know we may not need to have to make significant changes. Maybe you know change that one graphic. I'm not sure that I know the answer. I think I have some ideas about what some of those characteristics might be. Uh, refactor, but I, I do believe that. We do need to be uh, thoughtful about again, not change for change sake, destabilizing things because that's provocative. Um, and, but I, I would agree as well with uh, uh, my opponent that uh, was to restate it. I think we need to be focusing uh, less on content development. At least as practicing enterprise architecture, we got to build stuff, reference architectures and standards and processes. But I think. There's a lot of content out there, but I think there's a lack of usage of it. And I think a part of that is not, uh, as enterprise architects, we are not building the right content or delivering it the right way so that it is actually consumable by the people that are supposed to be using it. And I would suggest that is a symptom of waterfall development, right? You come up with requirements, go build the software, throw it over the wall, and then you know, let the people in operations fix all the problems and we weren't listening and interacting with people what they can. So I, I, again, I do think we still need to inject um, agile best practices into the application um, uh, of the uh, of the TOGAF ADM. Again, how that actually manifests itself, I'm not exactly sure. But I do not think we need to, you know, significantly uh, uh, destabilize the, the current effort, but more think about how to make it more consumable and accessible to the people that need to know. Thank you. Um, and there's a couple of really interesting points I think in, in there for, for me. Um, and um, in thinking about this particular debate, I was uh, minded to think about other standards. Um, so, and you know, I was I was Prince trained, project management methodology trained before it was Prince two, so it's quite a long time ago. Um, and um, I think about that, and I've seen good Prince implementations, and I've seen not so good print implementations. Um, but actually what varied and when as a as a recipient of, the, of being in those projects and a recipient of that kind of set of standards, I, I didn't feel the need to go back and say you must change the print standard. What I felt was actually you need to change the way that people are using it. So for example, I, I would attend um, 
uh, risk management meeting and simply because the project manager has said, right, I've now got a risk register, I've written down some risks, we've put some numbers against it, and we'll have another meeting next week, and we'll put some more numbers down against it, more numbers, that's risk management done. And it'd be like, no, you're missing the point. You're following what it says. I don't think the spec needed to change in prints for that person to realize, actually, that's not what risk management is. It's a behavioral thing. So I think what does good look like, that's your reference patterns, your architectures, your exemplars, is, is an excellent way of demonstrating what, what should happen. So supplementing the spec with good examples, worked ideas, how, how it should work. But then the other side is the behaviors part. How do you get the people to work? Um, you know, I, I do hear from, from CIOs who say they don't have, they don't, if they have a problem with their enterprise architecture efforts, they don't go, the problem is my ADM. The problem, what they do is they the problem is my enterprise architecture team. And they're not talking to the development people. They're not getting out of their ivory tower and going and having a conversation. And it's the dialogue that's important there, not the change to the specification. May, may I ask um, the questioners to stand up so so all eyes can be on you so you can start that networking connection with the, the like-minded people. So. Well, you know, uh, an observation with future drawers. Our architects with future drawers, but we're focusing on the ABM as a picture. Nothing about the substance behind it. What does it mean? Method. Method. Can you buy to Can you be agile in your method? Can you be static in your method? Yes, you can. It almost becomes relevant. But let's look at the picture. And let's look at what it says. A, B, C, D. It's a business problem. That's what we're here to solve. That's what we're always here to solve. That always comes first. Data. Yep. It's the raw ingredients. Without that, business doesn't work. Applications and infrastructure logically come after this. So the sequence of events are correct in the picture. We're not necessarily saying they're multiple, we're just saying that the logical sequence of events itself. So should ADM be agile? Probably not. Should we as architects be agile? Most definitely. Yeah.
yeah, so I, I think one of the interesting points really for me uh, is a little bit of the legacy in Bob in terms of the way that the director, if you think of it as the book, and that was the master and the book, you know, classically in, in the Western world we start the front and, and read through it as students. Um, and therefore there is a tendency, you know, that mind the model to kind of think of things in a certain way. But what it also reminds me of is, is uh, one place I worked a little while ago, um, there were two organisations, a uh, supplier and uh, the end user organisation. And between the two organisations was a huge, great big contract, probably along the side of the Tokyo Lake, the um, And actually the contract kind of was between the two organisations and was used as a kind of safety buffer. You know, and it kind of got in the way of the interaction that was necessary. So, for me, I think one of the things that's quite key is that we shouldn't focus on the specification as our thing to hide behind that's going to condition our world and keep us safe from agile developments, changes to the business, etc. We need to be able to use it um, ourselves for our own consumption and therefore we have to work out how to interpret it. But actually, um, we need to make sure it's not front and centre, it's not the thing that we uh, obsess about. Um, and I think that's quite uh, the, the point really for me. Thank you. Uh, I am going to have to call a, a, a close, even though it's a little bit before, <coughs> because uh, we, we have five minute uh, summations and then uh, we need to get you all uh, a break. <coughs> We're going to start uh, now with uh, Paul to do uh, okay. your so, closing statements. Um, so probably I don't think I've uh, left anything unsaid in terms of what you can before, but I want to go back to my Hippocratic post, um, which was a, a slight sort of a, a pun, but uh, you know, there is a, a line and I, I don't expect everyone to kind of but if you did Google it, you would find that the line is close to one of the ones in the middle of the original traffic uh, code because it's expected. But just to repeat it, you know, I, I will apply for the benefit of the enterprise all architectural practices which are required, avoiding those twin traps of over governance and architectural denial. So basically, it's about finding the right level of guidance and governance, looking after the enterprise as a well. whole. Now, it's valuable for me for two reasons. One is I think you have to understand your patient, your organisation, what's appropriate to them, that's what you're there for. But the other reason that I think is useful with this context is that was, um, is a translation from the Greek by Hippocrates uh, from uh, you know, thousands of years ago, um, and that was actually laid out the, the modern democratic code in the 1960s, which is true to Dean and Zanin. Um, it's still used today, and in the last 50 odd years, there have been an awful lot of developments around technology and medicine, advancements in practices, and ethics codes, different fields of medicine. Um, but the same democratic code is still valid. What changes are the practices around them that uh, people uh, adopt and sign up to the ethics around those things. So uh, for me, that kind of just reinforces that the ADM spec is fit for purpose as our core Hippocratic oath, if you will, um, and that what we need to focus on, what we should worry about, uh, are how we apply that and the behaviours that we have to the various advances and changes we have. So thank you, that's important. Thank you very much. So again, thanks everybody uh, for joining us uh, here this morning in uh, in our experiment. Uh, again, I, I still uh, obviously have not been swayed by my worthy opponent's uh, arguments. Uh, I do believe the specification does need to change uh, to uh, individuals' observations. It may not need to be significantly changed. I'm not talking about throwing the whole dang thing away and making up a new one from scratch. I would certainly be. Full
foolhardy. I do think we should make changes to the uh, crop circle. I think it needs to be retired. It was a great, wonderful thing to get us to where we are now, but it needs to be uh, subsumed by a more modern representation so that we don't continually have to dance our way around it and say, well, you know, it's not, you know, the ADM is agile, even though it looks like it's not agile. And you'll understand, you know, once you become a part of the club. Um, so I think that's being a little disingenuous, particularly that we do not, we, we want to be very careful about disenfranchising the largest community in many cases that we're serving, which is the solution delivery community. There are, what, 50 million developers, 100 million developers? I mean, I would say anybody that has an electronic device might claim themselves to be a developer. Maybe there's a billion developers. How many enterprise architects are there? And, you know, at the risk of my, uh, uh, my own uh, uh, visage, uh, you know, there, uh, a lot of enterprise architecture communities are populated by us gray hairs, right? Uh, I'm 50 years old, uh, still hope to be kicking around here for quite some time, but I think we do need to be thoughtful about where is the next generation of enterprise architects going to come from? And if the current body of knowledge is not recognized, the, uh, the, the typical emergent path for EA is not the sole one, coming from the developer community, and if we don't even, in the standard, recognize the words that they talk about every single day, agile and lean, I think we run uh, uh, a great risk at um, um, bringing those people into uh, our tradition. Um, I think, again, we do not necessarily need to, to throw out what's there, you know, refactor some stuff, but I do think we need to add some supplemental guidance uh, to the specification to make it a little bit more clear so that A, as a profession, um, I think there's a emergence of what we think we mean by delivering enterprise architectural in an agile fashion, but I think it behooves our profession that we get together and try to have some convergence on that so that we're all telling the same story, not to say that it's all figured out and we can write it down um, and it will uh, never change. Uh, so, um, um, again, uh, my uh, uh, appreciation for your patience and willingness uh, and, and brave, bravery in participating in this experience. Some of those uh, agile uh, values uh, in that ecosystem, you know, honesty, integrity, and bravery. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we certainly have a great foundation to stand upon as we try to take this uh, best practice forward into the 22nd century. Thanks so much. Thank you.